Okay, shalom to everyone. Uh, can I grab your attention? We would like to begin this uh, webinar. Good evening to Ambassador Ido Aharoni in Israel, and good afternoon to our participants on the East Coast, and good morning to our Pacific Coast participants. My name is Dina Wachtel, and on behalf of myself and my colleagues here at Canadian Friends of Hebrew University, it is our pleasure to welcome you all to this new webinar series featuring presentations designed to inform and inspire us all. Before we begin, I just want to thank my colleague Ayala Davis, who is co-hosting this webinar with me. All right, so our presenter will speak for about half an hour, and then we will open the floor to questions and answers. To ask a question, you may either wave to us by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen, or type your question in the Q&A box and our panelists will see you. Please remember that once we call your name to ask your question, you need to unmute your mic manually. Also remember that there are so many of you out there that we may not be able to include all your questions. It is my honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, Ambassador Ido Aharoni. Ido Aharoni serves as Global Distinguished Professor for International Relations at New York University's Faculty of Arts and Science. He is a co-founder of Emerson Rigby, LTD, a member of the International Advisory Council of APCO Worldwide, a global ambassador for Maccabi World Union, and the chairman of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy. A 25-year veteran of Israel's Foreign Service, founder of the Brand Israel Program, and a well-known nation branding practitioner. Ambassador Aaroni has been Israel's longest serving Consul General in New York and the Tri-State area, which is Israel's largest diplomatic mission worldwide. Ambassador Aaroni, take it away. Thank you so much, Dina, and uh, thank you all for joining us. I know that we have uh, friends uh, from all over the world. I know that uh, we have friends that um, are here from, from Italy, and from other parts of the world. By the way, can you can you guys see my presentation on the screen, which I shared? We will see it in a second. It says, uh, bring your shared window to the front. I don't know what that means, but let me. Yeah, we see you, Ido. You see, you see me, but you don't see the presentation. You see the presentation. Oh, you do? Yeah. Wonderful. That's okay. That's terrific. So I just wanted to uh, specifically say hi to our friends from Italy that are on the line. Uh, Italy was hit hard by the COVID-19 virus and uh, we're all sending you, I'm sending you from Israel and, and the rest of the friends from wherever they are, um, our, our wishes for strength and resilience. And I'm sure that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get over this uh, major, major challenge. Uh, today, I was asked to speak about the rise of the new participant. I'll talk about what it means um, to be a new participant. What is participatory culture? And I think that what's happening around us in the last several weeks with, the, uh, with this new pandemic of uh, COVID-19 only uh, further emphasizes the need to have that discussion. So first of all, uh, COVID-19 in many, many ways, let me just devote a few words to that, is the perfect storm. In what way? It's the perfect storm because of several reasons. It exposed almost simultaneously um, the global leadership crisis, which I'll be more than happy to elaborate during the Q&A session, but uh, the leadership crisis stems largely from the fact that the the new type of political leadership that is being that, that, that was created as a result of the information revolution um, is very different than um, the leadership of the past that we know that we knew. There are no more David Ben Gurions. There are no more Winston Churchills. And there's a big question as to why. And I believe that technology and the information revolution is a big part of the reason why we don't have David Ben Gurions anymore. Um, Coronavirus also exposed the systemic underperformance of health systems worldwide, the lack of preparedness on the part of the governments, uh, governmental ineptitude in almost every area of, of, the, of the way that's being dealt with all over the world. If you 
go to the very beginning of the, of the crisis in China, when I say governmental ineptitude, I also refer to the fact that the Chinese government failed to be transparent about what was happening. Imagine how the course of the evolution of this pandemic could have been different, could have been altered, if only the Chinese had been more transparent from the very, very beginning. Just think about that. Of course, decision-making in, uh, in, in, in a condition of uncertainty is very challenging, and the crisis exposed that. And obviously, the information overload and the anxiety it creates, we'll talk a lot about it because it's a big part of the information revolution. Um, I don't have to tell you, most of you are very uh, familiar with the evolution of, the social, of society and economy throughout history. We went from being an agrarian society to industrial society to a technological society. The technological society is based on standing on three legs, basically automation, technology, obviously knowledge, economy, uh, the economies that are based on knowledge. The Israeli economy is a perfect example of economies that can be successful without natural resources. And, uh, and lastly, the information revolution. The information revolution is perhaps the most dramatic revolution um, in, the, in the history of mankind in what sense? The first is that we are now creating more information than ever before. If you look at all the information that was created by past civilizations, no other civilization was able to record every note, every image, every word, every idea that was ever produced or conceived. Our civilization is the first civilization in the history of mankind that can actually do that. The volume of the information that we create as, as a civilization is unprecedented. Just think about that we double the size of the US Library of Congress every other day. That's how much information we are producing as mankind. And then the access given, given to us to retrieve that information, the speed that we can do that, um, and the ability to predict people's behaviors, right? When you we're all now in our homes and we're all watching Netflix and Hulu and, uh, and we're all watching other streaming services. I want you to know that the ability of those streaming services to accurately predict our taste, our future selection is beyond imagination. I can tell you that at least as far as I'm concerned, and I've been on Netflix for five years now, Netflix has been 100% accurate with their recommendations and their predictions. In other words, Netflix is in a position, we call it predictive segmentation for a reason. They know before they even spend a dollar in one production, they already know what is the potential of, of that production to succeed. But above all, the biggest thing that the information revolution is doing is giving us the ability to self-design our own news feed. What does it mean? It means that we are now the editors of our own information. And that also means that the barrier for participation was lowered. The technological barrier for participation in media, for participation in internet and online and virtually induced conversation is lower than ever before. Um, now we know that participation, whether we used to sort the rice together or we used to uh, make a quilt together or we used to attend a musical concert together or we used to participate in a political demonstration together. We know that participatory culture has always existed. Um, it existed in every area of life, from sports to culture to art. It was really ubiquitous, still is ubiquitous. The information revolution um, gave it a new face. The person that really was first to notice that there is a whole new culture developing in the virtual world on, in cyberspace is a social anthropologist from the University of Southern California by the name of Henry Jenkins. And you can see his, his picture right here on that part of the screen. And Henry Jenkins was the first to say that actually participation became a culture. How do you know that something becomes a culture? Because it's ha it has its own um, codes of behavior. For example, um, Henry Jenkins noticed that there is a very strong element of informal mentoring between participants in this online culture that is being developed. For example, 
older people are learning from younger people how to behave. They're learning how to be digitally literate. I'll give you an example. My mom is almost 88 years old and her great grandchildren are helping her online. The second element of that culture is the fact that we all became co-producers of content. If in the past, we were referred to in passive terms, right? We were referred to as voters or patients, clients, customers, not, not anymore. We are now co-producers or co-creators. We are participating rather than passively and unilaterally absorbing information. We already spoke about the low barrier for participation. We're only one click away from participation. And sometimes we don't even have to click. Just by doing something, we're participating. For example, if we're using Waze, which we're not using now because we're all at home, but if you're using a navigation software, you're participating. If you're using Amazon, you're participating. If you're using Netflix, you're participating in a conversation that is much bigger than us. There are very clear codes of behavior in this new participatory culture. And contrary to what people will tell you, it's actually a very positive, very inclusive, very forthcoming, and very embracive culture. We call it the culture of like. Think about it. When was the last time you posted on Facebook a picture of a cake that you baked or a picture of your grandkid and you received a negative response? It almost never happens. People are always very positive. It's true that some people on the fringe tend to be negative. They tend to be radical. They tend to be even verbally violent, but this is the minority and the rule and, certain, and certainly the exception to the rule rather than the rule itself. Uh, participatory culture, as I said before, is ubiquitous. It's all encompassing. It covers every area of our life, especially culture, art, education, and the economy. And it is being enhanced by the pace, by the access, by the flat hierarchy of the information revolution. Let me just give you one story to, um, to demonstrate really the power of participatory culture. So you see here in this picture is my sister-in-law. Her name is, uh, is Karen. And um, in fact, Karen is uh, strongly related to the Hebrew University because her grandfather was Lou Boyer, the founding president of the American Friends of the Hebrew and the person who really raised all the money to build Mount Scopus. And, um, and um, Karen is now 68 years old. When she was 18, she gave birth to, um, to a baby girl and she had to give her for adoption. And um, she uh, was not in touch with her uh, for 50 years. And several months ago, she received an email from the biological father, who by the way, never knew that he got her pregnant, uh, that he received an email through, um, uh, 23 and me from a woman who claims that um, he is her biological father. He responded to her by saying, look, it's impossible. I never had any children. The guy is 68 years old. He had no idea that he got my sister-in-law pregnant when she was 18. And of course, lo and behold, they connected with the daughter. And after 50 years of not seeing her baby, um, now she reconnected with her daughter. This is a very moving story. It happened in my family and it's very close to me. And I can tell you, this is the power of participation. And sometimes we, we don't even realize what it means to take part in, in those uh, platforms. But because the, 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 the barriers for participation are so low, all you have to do is register. All you have to do is be part of that conversation. But the impact is overwhelmingly positive actually. And you can see it even now in the age of coronavirus, how participation is actually helping people to educate each other, to mentor each other, and so on. So the big question that we ask ourselves is this, who are those new participants? How do we define them? How can we characterize them? So you have the classic definition, which is generational. It's the chronological typification of the various generations from the GIs, uh, born between 1901 to 1926, to the silent generation, to the baby boomers, all the way to the millennials and generation Z. If you are following uh, the work of organizational consultants like McKinsey, you're looking at the four classic typifications. These are the, this is the industry standard. When we talk about generational behavior, 
These are the typification. These are the four most discussed, most talked about generations in the world of marketing and organizational analysis. But what we argue is that actually participation is something that is not necessarily chronological. It's something that doesn't necessarily have an age, although most new participants tend to be younger. It is a cross-generational phenomenon. If you're spending hours every day using media, no matter how old you are, you are a new participant. Now, we're talking about about 40% of world population in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, we're talking about 30% of the population. So it's, it's almost half of world population that has access to media that is part of that new conversation that is technologically induced. So what are the characteristics of the new participants? The first thing is they see themselves as living in a borderless world with an ever expanding social circle. So it's true that today because of Corona, think about it, we are all confined to our homes, to our private spaces, but through technology, we're actually continuing to expand our social circles. I can tell you myself, I spend about an hour or two every day massaging my database, expanding my, my network of circles and connections on LinkedIn and Facebook almost every day. I spend hours doing that. I'm still expanding my social circles. What's very, very important to know about the new participants is that they have a very strong urban identity. So their city comes first. I know it sounds crazy because we're in the middle of this crisis that is all about the behavior of national governments. But let me tell you, people do identify with cities. And even when you look at the coronavirus, they're using, they, they call it Wuhan, was the place where the virus started. Today, New York is the epicenter. People still, and in Italy, we talk about Bergamo, and people use names of cities rather than nations because this is what they identify with. So if you live in Spain, it's one thing, but if you're from Barcelona, it's a different thing. And, and the experience, so I can tell you from Israel's point of view, there was a big outcry in Israel many, many years ago when it, it was discovered that young Israelis preferred to move to Berlin. And a lot of uh, older Israelis were perplexed by it and said, how come they, they're moving to Germany? not realizing that in the eyes of those young Israelis, Berlin was not Germany, just as Barcelona is not Spain, just as Tel Aviv is not Israel, and just as uh, maybe Toronto is not Canada. Those urban centers are very, very unique, and they, they generate a very strong sense of identity and identification. Um, the new participant are able, as I said before, to design their own information environment, which is unprecedented and it changes everything. Why? In the old days, when you picked up a newspaper, someone else made a decision for you what's important and what's not. Those were the VIPs of the old world, the editors. Today, that power was taken away from them. If in the past the world was communicating to us by a handful of commentators, then today we are free to choose and design our own informational resources, which means that we become our own editors. And we're working vis-a-vis -a, -vis a very precise and very sophisticated algorithm. And that algorithm actually reflects our desires, reflects our areas of interest, and it creates, hence, the echo chamber, the, the famous echo chamber. We are producing that information. One of the characteristics of people that do that is that, for example, they view force as an illegitimate thing. No matter what you do, whether it's police or military, their view on using force is unfavorable, which is something the state of Israel, for example, has to take into account. This is one of the signs of the participatory culture. Trust is the defining issue of new participants. The most important thing for them is that you will develop the level of trust that they can live with. What does it mean for them uh, to be trustworthy? You have to stay true to your purpose. Obviously, first you have to have a purpose. You have to be accountable. You have to make a positive contribution to society. You have to be reliable. You have to be value-driven. 
and you have to be transparent. If you want to understand why people don't trust governments, just look at this column right here and you'll understand why people don't trust governments. Certainly not the Chinese government that did not tell us the truth from the very beginning of the, of the crisis. And here on the right hand side, you can see the same thing among millennials. It's even more radical. This is my own personal trust chart. And it's interesting to see how Facebook, in my view, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm not alone, is uh, really declining in the level of trust. And on the other end, you have Microsoft. And the reason why Microsoft is more trustworthy in the eyes of participants than Facebook is because Microsoft was successfully and aggressively branded as the uncool brand by Apple. This happened in, in the 1990s. And as a result, Microsoft was left out of the conversation uh, about trust that included Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, but not Microsoft. And Microsoft, in many ways, is making a very interesting comeback. The new participants are getting their information from a very interesting source. Um, we call it the late night shows in the United States, but certainly not your traditional, conventional news sources. In fact, they don't even watch the news. They don't even read the news. They get their information from those shows that, I, that you see right here. It's very, very interesting. A very interesting character is John Oliver. John Oliver is very relevant to the new participant. Why? Because John Oliver combines comedy with investigative journalism. The kind of reports that he does are always relying on doing the right thing. If you if you look at the way he selects the topic to investigate, it's always about doing the right thing, which leads me to the things that, the issues that they care about. What are the issues that the new participants care about? The number one, by the way, is lifestyle. 80% of them report that the main reason for them to spend hours online is because they want to retrieve information about the way they should be living their lives. They're very big on sustainability and the environment, health and fitness technology and connectivity, uh, social and the rights, social justice and the rights conversation is very important to them. Privacy and transparency, by the way, they don't see any conflict between the demand for privacy and the need to be transparent. Uh, they have two things that are critically important to them, to the new participants. And by the way, this is all based on a global study that covered 22 uh, countries all over the world conducted by uh, the, the brand S evaluator, which I'll be more than happy to elaborate during the Q&A session. The worldview is based on two things. The first is their view that uh, we have to be, to live in a, in a more just world. It's all about fairness and it's all about identity. Fairness on three levels. Be, be fair to your own self, meaning uh, be fair to your own body, treat your body well. That means to engage more in fitness and eat healthy and consume in a responsible way. Uh, be fair to fellow human beings. That's the whole social justice conversation. And be fair to the environment. That's the whole um, ecolo ecological protection conversation and environmental conversation, climate change, preservation, conservation, these are all things that they care about. These are things that actually change their behavior. When you see how many people change the way they eat, how many people now engage in physical activity, how many people now care more about the environment, it's clearly that fairness is a game changer in terms of the worldview. And the other thing is, uh, and by the way, this is a quote from the governor of England's central bank, who's claiming that firms that will ignore climate crisis will actually go bankrupt. Now, I don't know if he's right, but what's important is that he thought it was important to say that. And this was a statement from last November. So this is four months ago from the governor of England's central bank. And the other leg, if I said the first element that defines them is, is fairness, the second is identity. It's all about who am I? Who's my tribe? What's my background? What's my family history? Who's my city and who's my nation? It's about 
their own history, it's about their own identity. And in many ways, there's an open debate in the academic world. Are we looking at the most connected group in history or the most disconnected group in history? And the answer is probably both. We are connected right now, technologically, but because of, the, of that echo chamber, we are thematically disconnected. Each echo chamber, each filter bubble, each, um, each environmental, each informational feed is dramatically different than the other. No feed is identical to the other. And so we have to understand that it creates a whole new world and we'll, and I'll give you a couple of, of examples. So to sum it up, who are the new participants? They tend to be younger, the younger, although they don't have to be younger. They see themselves as co-producers of content. They take the content that they produce very seriously. It's about 30% of the BRIC countries, about 40% of the rest of the world. They have a strong urban identity. They see themselves as living in a global borderless world. They're issue oriented and value driven, fairness and identity. They're engaged and disengaged at the same time. They're not looking for definitive answers to every question. They see themselves as work in progress. They live fine with conflict. They have a profound mistrust when it comes to institutions and especially governments. They believe technology is empowering and they're looking for immediate gratification. I will not bore you with the details of the study itself. I just wanna show you that this is based on, on, on a major statistical and, and empirically valid study that was done all over the world. Uh, what defines them is that they're ridiculously connected, they're trendy, they're relationship driven, they're adventurous, they're discerning, and they're major, major shoppers. Um, again, I, want, I don't, don't want to go into the numbers. I would like to leave something for, uh, for the Q&A. This is interesting, though. The brands they don't love, um, Walmart, ESPN, uh, Beats by Dr. Dre, Polo by Ralph Lauren, Dr. O's Show, Lifetime Channel, Lululemon, Athletica, and so on. The brands they love more, uh, Instagram, Yelp, Hebrew National, God knows why Hebrew National. Uh, they like WikiLeaks, they like Greenpeace, they like Dom Perignon, they like Xbox, they like ST Lauder, uh, Bluebird by American Express, um, Vespa is a very cool brand among new participants. This is for our Italian friends. Um, how to connect with them? They're looking for brands that are up to date, social friendly, progressive, visionary, innovative, intelligent, fun. If you're familiar as friends of Hebrew U with the Genius 100 initiative, this is exactly what it's all about. Uh, being friendly, social, progressive, innovative, visionary, intelligent, and fun. Now, new participation did something very, very dramatic to politics. And, um, and, and, and this is also directly related to the way we're dealing today with the coronavirus challenge. Um, if you know, um, the history of politics was entirely based on the distance that existed between the political leader and his or her constituency. With the information revolution, that distance was taken away. The distance in the past allowed what we call mystification. Mystification is either intentional attempt to conceal information or unintentional distance that exists between leaders and constituents. Mystification, for example, allowed Americans um, to live perfectly fine without knowing that their leader, FDR, was a disabled person. The very same mystification, the very same distance, allowed FDR to hide the fact that he put in camps during World War II over 100 law-abiding American citizens only because they were of Japanese background in internment camps in California. Right, the same distance and the same mystification allowed JFK to conceal his whole shenanigans in the White House, right? Fast forward 30, 40 years and Bill Clinton is less able to mystify. And we are now looking at a process called demystification, which is the disappearance of that distance. And it creates a new political environment where the new political attraction in the age of participation 
actually stems from what we call perceived authenticity, impulsive or reflexive behavior, and disruptive behavior. The best example would be Donald Trump, um, whose main appeal is the, is the fact that he is 100% reflexive. So even when he's not telling the truth, he's doing it authentically. Even when his vulnerabilities are, are exposed as a narcissistic personality, is doing it genuinely. In other words, is not trying to be someone else, he's being himself. And, uh, and to a large degree, I think you can see that um, there's a new type of political attraction. It's uh, disturbing to many people, but that's the way it is. And it happens on both ends of the political debate in Israel, in the United States, in England, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Gerald Post, who was the former head of uh, the division within the CIA that was in charge of um, compiling uh, psychological profiles of world leaders for the President of the United States, and uh, most notably, he was the one who wrote the profiles on Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat for President Carter in the 1970s. He wrote a book called Politics and Narcissism, Dreams of Glory, which I urge all of you to read. The book opens with an analysis of Saddam Hussein and Bill Clinton, but uh, uh, he draws some fascinating conclusions that you can uh, apply almost in every, in every country in the world. What Gerald Post claims is that because of the new media environment, because of this new participatory culture, if a personality doesn't have a combination of those three elements, they cannot survive this new media environment. What are the elements? You have to be, to a certain degree, a compulsive personality, paranoid and narcissistic in order for you to survive. Obviously, not all of them have all three elements. And the, you know, there's a, there's a, set, a certain balance and the, the set, a certain, um, uh, the, the certain difference. There's some people that are more cons compulsive than paranoid and vice versa, but there has to be an element of a self-centered personality, paranoid personality and compulsive personality in order for an individual to survive, to be able to function in the current media environment of the online world and the online conversation. And I think that if you think, if you will give it some thought and you will analyze the political leaders, especially in the Western world, but not only in the Western world, you look at Vladimir, Vladimir Putin, you look at Bill Clinton, you look at Bibi Netanyahu, you look at Donald Trump. And again, I don't know uh, Trudeau that well, but I suspect that almost every political leader, Berlusconi of Italy at the time, uh, Sarkozy, whom I had a chance to meet, definitely, you look at them and you see, and you see those elements, it's actually uh, pretty self-explanatory. That leads us that in that, in that world, uh, no wonder that uh, we are entering uh, in a very, very obvious way, the post-truth era. What does it mean, the post-truth era? where narrative, where, where the ability to tell a story becomes more important than the story itself and the facts themselves. This is a beautiful picture. On the left-hand side, you can see the inauguration of President Obama from the air. On the right-hand side, you can see the inauguration of President Trump from the air. Now, Trump openly claimed that his inauguration was um, the most attended inauguration in the history of presidential inaugurations. Although the pictures show a different story. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to him. It did not matter to his supporters. And it only um, emphasizes the point that we live in a, different, in a different era today where the facts are not so important and uh, the truth is not so important. The truth is only one option among many. And what's more important is the ability to be able to tell a story. And, uh, and, we, and I'll be more than happy to, to elaborate that uh, during the Q&A session. I'd like to leave some time for, for questions, so I will, I will do it uh, very quickly. Um, information overload is a big part of this new participatory culture. What is an information overload? Is, you know, our brain was never designed to handle all that information that we have been given access to. And it, it, it has 
a tremendous impact. The impact is that information overloads, uh, highs, it heightens the level of anxiety. When we're anxious, we tend to do two things. We tend to, first of all, we tend to make mistakes. We tend to uh, surround ourselves with people that are like-minded and we tend to look for simple solutions to highly complex problems, right? Hence Brexit, hence the Mexico border wall. These are all fantastically simple solutions to highly complex problems. And, um, and one of the things that are happening as a result of information overload is the, it's, it's flattening the political conversation. It gives rise to the politics of identity, meaning if you're a feminist, you're not supposed to be pro-Israel. If you're gay, you're not supposed to be pro-Israel, and so on and so forth. This is the politics of identity. And there's also marketing identity, right? The identity marketing. If you're a true American, you're supposed to drive a Chevrolet and so on and so forth. I can give you many, many examples. But this has huge implications for governments, countries, nations, and societies. The most important thing is that we are shifting very quickly from a model of advocacy to a model of marketing. At the end of the day, we have to remember we're all in that world of participation, in that world of echo chambers, in that world of algorithms. At the end of the day, we're all preaching to our own choirs. You have to remember that. The people that watch Fox News are the people that watch Fox News. They're very, very similar. Just as the people that read the New York Times, they're very like-minded. The people that read Breitbart or the people that read Haaretz. Um, at the end of the day, those media outlets, the traditional media outlets, because of the fact that they're so predictable, became less and less influential because we moved from a centralized conversation that gave them a lot of power to a radically proliferated conversation, we call it narrow casting, that took the power away from them. It means that content is more important than platform. It means that quality overrides quantity. It means that people are interested in the dialogue rather than a monologue. It means that you need to be attractive. It's more important than being right. You have to be able to tell a story. You have to be creative and you have to learn segmentation rather than just know what, what it is that you wanna say. Um, I will leave it to you uh, to continue this conversation amongst yourselves and even here uh, with me with questions. So I'll be more than happy at this point to open the conversation for your questions, Dina. Thank you very much, Ambassador Aroni, for taking the time uh, to present to us today. That was an interesting and informative presentation. Now, if anyone has any questions, now would be the great time. Please remember that once we call your name to ask your question, you need to unmute your mic manually. And uh, I would like to start with one question. You mentioned that the new participants tend to be younger. And we do see a decline, sometimes even lack of emotional intelligence or interpersonal skills. Uh, what do you think is the price that we pay as a society for that? for less of less emotional intelligence? Yes, less ability to, everybody is into the technology, meeting partners, meeting other people through yeah. various social platforms. What do we lose in the process? So the science is still young on this. There is a very famous book written by Howard Gardner from Harvard University, um, who is a psychologist who coined the term multiple intelligences. He wrote a book, The App Generation, and, uh, and that book is trying to analyze the impact of applications that are technological shortcuts on the brains of young people. And he found that there's a tremendous impact on their understanding of intimacy and, our, and their understanding of relationship. For example, they can end serious relationship with a text message. Um, and, uh, and to us, it may seem like uh, there's something profoundly wrong with that. But we have to understand it's not that they don't care, it's just a different way to express themselves. Um, you know, things, that, th things are changing. And again, the science is still very young on this. We have uh, still at least, I believe, at least a generation, if not more, before we really understand the impact 
of those technological shortcuts on our memory, on our understanding of reality and our understanding of relationship and even our understanding of knowledge. What does it mean to really know something? Um, you know, I, um, I, I hate to sound like an old timer, but I, I have students now and I teach and I compare their ability to write to the ability of my generation. Um, and I can tell you, I know it sounds terrible and I shouldn't be doing this. Um, generalizing is never a good thing, but from my experience, the level of ability to express in writing is declining. Thank you. Adam. All right, I see that we have a question from um, Robert Sarner. Hi, Bill. First of all, thank you. Uh, that was an extremely timely, <laughs> thought-provoking and, and uh, insightful uh, presentation. A lot of food for thought there. So my question relates to uh, the unprecedented reality that we all are living through thanks to coronavirus. So given that, that most people are now stuck in their homes, making them an even more captive audience to the current, uh, really it's a tsunami of, of information and media coverage of the pandemic. What do you think people should actually do to better cope with, I guess, the anxiety that goes with this overabundance of information? And actually you cited toward the end of your presentation, the kinds of hazards that this surplus of information can cause. What do you recommend under the current reality how people can better cope with this? So my, my advice would be just to um, not to watch the news. <laughs> uh, that's what I've been doing. Um, and the reason is very simple. The, the news channels are counting the number of people infected by coronavirus. Now, I'm not saying anything I don't want you to understand that I don't think that the coronavirus is, is not a big crisis. I think it's a huge crisis. It's a game changer. However, I want you to imagine this. Imagine that what the news channels are doing now, they would have done every year with the seasonal flu. What would have happened in the world? Every year. I mean, it's in, in Iceland, for example, they did something that was not done in any other country because it's a small country and they could have done it, they could do it. They simply randomly tested the whole population. And what they discovered was that the coronavirus is no Hello? Yes, we hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. And so, um, so I said in, in Iceland, they discovered that there's a discrepancy between the scope of the threat and the treatment that was um, decided by the international community. So my point is, uh, the best way to cope with information overload is simply force yourself to limit the information sources that you're being exposed to. Because you can go, it can, our brain was never designed to cope with so much information, with so many stimulations simultaneously. Um, it was never meant to be like that for us. And a lot of people, because of that, because of that inability to cope with this tremendous degree of stimuli, uh, they're looking to flatten the conversation and they're looking to find simple solutions to those heavy questions and the result are horrible decisions horrible decisions that will bring about a huge suffering to all human beings. There's no doubt in my mind. And, and history will judge whether we're treating COVID-19 the right way. We're in the middle of the crisis, but let me tell you, historians will look at it and, and because we don't really know what's the collateral damage of the decision to isolate people. We don't know how many people are actually dying right now because of that unrelated to COVID-19. We will know one day. Thank you. I see that we have a question from Dan Kalinsky. Go ahead, Dan. 
<laughs> yes. Hello, Shalom. Uh, apologies, I was struggling with uh, with the technology here. Uh, I think you answered this already because you were talking about the the crisis of leadership. I was just curious to to know uh, first of all if there is any any way out of it, and what what is or rather what is the new leadership? What does it need to look like? What are we really aspiring to? And the second question is, how do you reconcile the uh, idealistic tendencies which you've described in the in the society? How do you reconcile that with um, with support for narcissistic? Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start with the second question. There is no there is no contradiction. They care about the world. They care about the environment. They they care about other social other human beings and they care about social justice, uh, but they also very, very much care about themselves. And there is no contradiction. Regarding the quality of leadership, what does it mean? It means that we have to get used to the idea that political leaders are no longer going to think long-term strategically. Maybe COVID-19 crisis hopefully will change that because it, it exposed the fact that there was no long-term strategic thinking. Very few countries were actually prepared to deal with this. Let me give an example in Israel. In Israel, we have only 33 hospitals. The number of beds per every 10,000 people actually is lower, has never been lower in, actually, in Israel's history. So not only that Israel doesn't have enough hospital beds, we, were, we are completely unprepared to deal with any type of, of, of pandemic. And so, uh, and the reason is because the leadership is self-centered is mm -hmm. um, short is short-sighted they're not interested in anything but their own survival um and it's true to almost every country uh they um and what's going to happen in the future i'm afraid it's only going to get worse no matter what, who they are i don't see any any dramatic difference between donald trump and aoc i don't see any 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 difference in the sense that both of them are pathologically narcissistic. It doesn't even matter what they stand for. And I can give you, I don't want to go into names, but a very long list. And the reason is because normative people with healthy personality structure will not be able to survive. The scrutiny, they will not be able to survive the exposure. They will not be able to survive the pressure and you will not find them in politics. So it's only going to get worse. The good news is that we're entering a new era of citizen diplomacy. The power is shifting from governments to multinational corporations and to citizens to citizen groups. And this is exactly what we're seeing with uh, with the Genius 100 community uh, that was um, that was created in Canada a few years ago and other other similar initiatives. Thank you, Ido. Next, David Stampler. Hi there, uh, Ido, uh, wonderful talk. Um, we talk about information overload. I almost feel a little bit overloaded uh, myself from your talk. I look forward to reviewing the recording if it becomes available because um, there's a lot to think about there. Um, my question is, you were talking about the um, sort of late night talk shows and um, you know they're examining politics in a big way. So what would you say is the impact of information overload itself on politics? Well, information overload on politics can lead to uh, disastrous decision-making. And again, the jury is still out on what is being done right now, uh, but we will have to examine that. We, I want you to think about it. There is a good chance that we're looking at the biggest collective anxiety attack in history. And this could be one of the implications of information overload. Um, Brexit is a perfect example of information overload. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that the, in, the, the necessary information wasn't available. On the contrary, it was there, but people just couldn't handle it. Um, the perfect example is to see, I don't know if you had a chance to see John Oliver's piece on Brexit. You know, he's British himself. 
and he went to see this guy in um, in one of the English port towns who was growing flowers, shipping them to Europe every day. And he interviewed him, what would be the impact of Brexit on your business? And this uh, flower grower said, oh, that, that would be a complete devastation. I'll have to um, uh, let go 200 of my employees. And, um, and he went on explaining how difficult this is going to be for him financially. And then John Oliver said, just out of curiosity, what did you vote on Brexit? And the person said, honestly, I voted in favor of Brexit. And he asked him, how come? And he said, honestly, I had no idea what it actually meant. That's information overload. Information overload is not only too much information. It's also the less relevant information. So now with COVID-19, I'm being bombarded, I'm sure like all of you, with information about the virus and, treat, and then the ways to treat the virus and this and that. It's too much information. That's information overload. It elevates the level of anxiety, it impairs the level of decision-making, and it induces what we call digital tribalism. People want to be with people that are like them, like-minded people. That's called digital tribalism. Thank you, Ido. We have a question from Monet Malevsky. Hi, Ido. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful um, speech. And uh, like we said, overload. My question is, when you talk about the younger participants, you also said it crosses all the generations. And I'm seeing that the women in politics and the women in businesses seem to be participating very much like the younger one do and having a major impact. Can you give us your view of that? Yeah, and I think that it's a wonderful equalizer. Absolutely. You see, in, in the world of participation, where participation is an easy thing, uh, women participate um, in huge numbers, older people participate in huge numbers. Um, you see different minority groups that were, um, that felt disenfranchised, participate in big numbers. So participatory culture, by and large, is a very positive thing. Now, it's true that you'll find what we call cyberbullying. You'll find anti-Semitism. You will find bigotry. You will find uh, violence and, 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 uh, and, and aggressive behavior online, just as you will find them in real life. But by and large, a participatory culture is very inclusive. And I think that uh, women definitely uh, take a leadership role in many of the conversations. And you see that uh, so many of the influencers of our time are women, absolutely. And I think, in, in Monette, you're one of them yourself. Thank you. We will take two more questions. The next is from Aizeldin Abulesh. Aizeldin, do you hear us? You need to unmute your mic. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's very rich presentation, which raised many questions. But I want to ask just one question. When we speak about the era, the post-truth era, and what do we mean by truth? Oh and uh, we are, that we are seeking this and also to survive as leaders in this world, as you mentioned, compulsive behavior, baron paranoia, and narcissism. I think for me as a medical doctor, these are diseases. So truth, it means the right diagnosis. Do we want to survive to be sick or not? And also concerning, which do you recommend to go to human and health diplomacy or to political diplomacy? Well, I'm a big, thank you for, uh, these are excellent questions. I am a big proponent of citizen diplomacy or what we call new diplomacy, which means the shift from government to government to people to people. It's more about the communities. It's more about people to influence. And I think that you will see post uh, coronavirus, you will see a different world. Uh, it's true that the governments are playing right now the most critical role, but people are going to look at what the governments did, also look at their ineptitude after the crisis is over. So it may be the last hurrah 
uh, in many ways. Um, and, um, and the preparedness in the future will be given to international organizations, maybe to international corporations, I don't know. Uh, but um, there's no doubt in my mind that in some countries, people will do away with the current leadership because of their failure to handle the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so um, now regarding the personality traits that I mentioned, um, you know, there's nothing we, I can do about it. There's nothing we can do about it. It's simply the way of the world today. Um, you are, you have to be willing to expose yourself, warts and all, in order to succeed in politics. And not every person, certainly not every normative person is willing to do that, unfortunately. And, um, and it means that the system is designed to handle, now don't get me wrong, it's not that past political leaders were not narcissistic, they were. They were, it's just that they were not able to disrupt the international system the, in such an easy, you know, so, so easily like they're able to do today with technology. Now, you know, Plato uh, um, famously wrote about the philosopher King. The philosopher King was um, a leader who was primarily preoccupied with the well being of his or her people. These were thinkers who were given the authority to make decisions on behalf of the common good. And if you ask yourself, who are the, the, those kings that are also philosophers of, of our time? And you will hard pressed to find them in politics. You will be hard pressed to find them in politics. You will probably find them more in the business world. People, if you think about who's now talking about space, um, no, not governments anymore. People that talk about space are Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Richard Branson. And there are hardly any ambitious space related programs uh, initiated by governments anymore. So these are just tiny examples. You look at, um, um, at, at the whole social impact investment idea. It's not coming, it's not supported by governments. It's actually, it came from the private sector. And, um, and I can go on and on and on and make the argument for the non-centrality of governments. Although right now, governments are holding the central key uh, in combating COVID-19. But once this crisis is over, I'm sure that they will be scrutinized pretty seriously by their societies. Thank you. Last question we'll take from Raquel Hirsch. Raquel, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Aruni. This is not the first time I hear you speak, and every time I'm more impressed. So thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I have, uh, because, because the conclusions that I can draw from many of your statements are scary, I want to actually ask a more technical questions, question. Um, those of us who are interested in uh, understanding consumers right now, I wonder about the technical background to the research that you presented. If you were to repeat the study today, three weeks into this COVID uh, epidemic, would you think you would get the same results or has the world changed that some of these findings are no longer relevant? Thank you. No, I think it's, it's, it only strengthened the findings. Uh, we moved from a world of connectivity to a world of hyperconnectivity. In fact, that's the only interaction. Uh, I, don't like the, I don't like the phrase social distancing. I think it's physical distancing because socially, we've never been closer, if you think about it. Um, so the study, the study was conducted by the BAV. The BAV, um, and you can go online, www.bav.com is the world's largest database on the behavior of brands. It's maintained by um, advertising and marketing giant WPP. It was part of uh, Young and Wubicam, YNR. If you like the show Mad Men about the advertising industry, it was made based on Young and Rubicam, which was, which is the parent, you know, the, the, foundation of, uh, of YNR. Now it's called VML YNR, it doesn't matter. But um, uh, the, the BAV 
collects information about the behavior of brands since 1975. And they have thousands of brands in their database and they conduct their study which started only in the United States in 22 nations. The study about the new participant uh, is an ongoing study that started in 2014. And what I showed you today are findings from 2017, but it doesn't really change much. Um, for example, we know, I, I just looked at another study before I, I prepared for this presentation. We know that um, uh, the number of people that are engaged in online retail went up. Uh, in terms of participation, there's a very sharp decrease in people uh, actually uh, tuning into news websites, believe it or not. And the reason is because they're getting their news from their friends. I get a lot of my news about COVID-19 through my WhatsApp groups and my Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. I don't really need to go to the Wall Street Journal because I get the relevant Wall Street Journal stuff from my friends. And then of course, uh, um, adult content is sharply declining the, consumer, the, cons the consumption of adult content. And that's perhaps because people are at home with their children, but there's a very, very sharp decline reported in that area. So we know exactly what happened to people's consumption and, and consumption pattern as, as a result of COVID-19. And it's not dramatically that different than the study that I showed you. Uh, just like last comment, Adina has the slides. Uh, I'll be more than happy for her to share the slides with all of you uh, with uh, my email address. You feel, feel free to email me and ask me questions. And thank you so much for your um, patience and attention. Thank you very much, Ido. Yes, it's getting late in Israel, so this will be the end of our webinar today. As Ido mentioned, feel free to stay in touch with us. You can reach us at www.cfhu.org. I want to say a big thank you to everyone in Israel. Good night. And to all of those who are joining us from, from uh, the Canada, have a wonderful day. Goodbye.